Good afternoon and welcome to the Digital Transformation of Industries press conference at the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Welcome everyone in the room and everyone watching on live stream. The fourth industrial revolution revolution has had a massive impact on all industries. Today's panel are the experts on its impact and its opportunities. Sitting beside me is my colleague, Bruce Vein Veinelt, um, head of digital transportation transformation at the forum. And beside him is Peter Lacey, global managing director of strategy and sustainability at Accenture. Beside him is Stephanie Linnartz, Global Chief Commercial Officer at Marriott International. And last but definitely not least is Jean Philbert Ninsen Guina Guimana. And again, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've completely transformed the meaning of his name at this point. Uh, Minister of Youth and Information, Communication and Technology of Rwanda. So let's start with Bruce. On Tuesday, you released the findings of the Digital Transformation Initiative. Could you please share some of those findings? Um, yes, thank you, Alem. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's correct. We did launch the findings of the Digital Transformation Initiative on Tuesday. So that maybe a little bit about the background first of this initiative. We launched the Digital Transformation Initiative in 2015 in Davos two years ago. And we've been since collaborating very, very closely with our friends from Accenture on that, so thank you very much. It is one of the more ambitious projects at the World Economic Forum, and we really analyze the impact of digitalization and digital technologies on industries, on sectors, on the enterprise itself, and on society. And there's really two ways in which we did that. So we, uh, number one was that we did a number of industry deep dives with a 10-year view. So we analyzed what digital really does to healthcare between now and 2025, what it does to telecoms, media, oil and gas, mining and metals, etc. And we found about 130 digital initiatives, which we then quantified and analyzed. With digital initiatives, we mean things like the self-driving vehicle in the automotive industry or the connected healthcare worker in healthcare. What we then also did is that we had the, um, we took a step back and analyzed the common digital patterns, trends, and themes across these sectors, because digital war is a horizontal play. We had that hypothesis and we found that out. One of the really notable findings that we did come up with during the analysis of the horizontal topics was that there isn't really a shared or a common dialogue in digital across sectors, but also between sectors and the public voice because every single sector currently deals with digital separately. So one of the things that we created was an economic growth model, a pioneering economic growth model, which actually identifies and quantifies and thus allows to prioritize digital initiatives and then creates the basis for discussions between the public and the private sector to create incentive structures to unlock this value, this trap value to society. Maybe let me give you just one example to make it a little bit more tangible. We calculated, uh, we found out that by 2025, about 90% of all last mile delivery of parcels in logistics could be done by drones. So that obviously has a huge impact on society as far as CO2 emissions is concerned. Up to 87% of CO2 emissions can be saved dr through drone delivery. It has a substantial impact on industry. The last mile delivery, all of a sudden, the price gets reduced by 25%. However, currently, there's a huge roadblock to this happening, which is regulation. Nation states and regions are struggling as drones really, the, the pace of development of drones outpaces regulatory policies and, regu and regulation making. So in the US, for instance, just to give an example of how fragmented this is, Amazon has just launched or is, or is, um, is testing Amazon Prime Air. So in certain states and certain regions of the United States, it is entirely possible to deliver packages via drones. If you go to my home country, Germany, you're only allowed to fly drones as far as line of sight is concerned, which makes package delivery pretty much impossible. If you go a little bit south, where we are, where we are today in Switzerland, not a single drone would be allowed to fly above us here because it's just not allowed that drones fly across a bunch of people which, is more than f which counts more than five individuals. So any kind of urban flight, let alone package delivery, is not possible. So it's these kind of findings, identifying societal benefits and industry benefits and then looking at the roadblocks and working in public-private collaboration to unleash this trap value and maybe get rid of the roadblocks that are in place. 
and I'd, I'd happily talk a little bit more about the findings, but I realize I'm, I'm manipulating everybody's time at the moment, so I'll, I'll chime in later again. Thank you. Thank you. So, Peter, you're more from Accenture. You've really been part of writing uh, these reports, uh, doing the research on these findings. Can you speak more on how this model can be used by businesses mm -hmm. and how they can unlock these opportunities? Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, just to reciprocate and say we've been uh, uh, very, very um, pleased by the, the level of partnership that we've had both with the World Economic Forum, but also with many of the companies that have dedicated a lot of their time to this uh, and have shared their insights and indeed the governments uh, that we've worked with over the last two years on this project. Let me unpack a little more some of the uh, thinking around the framework to speak to your point about how it can be used. But before I do that, I, I think it's important to uh, give a sense of the size of the prize. You know, so we, we've talked before about the idea that over the next 10 years, uh, a little less than 10 years to 2025, there's $100 trillion of additional value available in the whole as a result of the digital transformation of industries and the application of the technologies that Bruce mentioned. But here is a really important point. Um, and it's an important point because there is a growing narrative uh, that is around fear of digital transformation and uncertainty. In our analysis, what we've shown is that 55% of the value of that 100 trillion uh, is not simply benefiting shareholders or owners or industry, but benefits directly society in terms of job creation, in terms of wages, in terms of benefits to customers, and indeed avoided costs as we see improvements in things like healthcare, and we see digital being deployed to tackle global issues like climate change. So I think that's a first point to make. This is uh, not to say that we should be Pollyannaish, not to say that there aren't going to be enormous challenges, uh, and that we shouldn't be safeguarding and thinking through carefully how we steward the journey, but there is a tantalizing prize on the table, not just for business, but also for society. So that would be my first point. I think the second point I would make is that what we've tried to do with this framework and this growth model that Bruce referred to is to bring the numbers to bear for an informed evidence-based discussion between business and government and other stakeholders. Now, on the one hand, we've deployed that uh, and actually piloted that with the government of the UK, uh, with the Danish government, and also with one of the major states in India to really look at not how that works in theory, but how it works in practice, identifying the biggest areas of opportunity for those regions to go after. And so far, it's beginning, I think, to really reveal insightful, uh, useful guidance for policymakers and business that can have a more evidence-based discussion on that. But that's not the only limit. Uh, that's not the limit for me. Actually, the, the real um, opportunity for business is to be able to quantify and map their investments, the technologies they're deploying, the new business models they're deploying, the interventions they're making in their ecosystem and supply chains, not just by being able to analyze and quantify the traditional return on investment that you might get uh, in an economic sense, in a traditional financial sense, but also to understand the benefit to customers, to workers, to society more broadly. And understanding that sweet spot and being able to quantify it, I think, will be the next generation of strategy around digital, bringing new levels of rigor and being able to really identify where there are those win-win hotspots, both for business and for society. Wonderful. Um, Stephanie, you're in an industry that's actually been one of the most uh, disrupted. Um, so what are the lessons that you at your company at Marriott International you've learned, but also what are the opportunities that you've found along the way? So a absolutely, a travel has certainly been an industry that has been um, impacted and disrupted by the digital revolution. Um, but let me let me start by giving a little context on travel because when I talk about the opportunity, I think these numbers will be will be interesting. So um, last year, 1.2 billion people traveled outside of their own country. That that doesn't count people that traveled within their country, but outbound, which is a quite a remarkable figure. By the year 2030, that figure will go to close to 2 billion people traveling outbound, which is pretty remarkable. The data um, suggests that for every 30 trips, roughly about one job is created. 
So that means, you know, if these figures are even in the ballpark, we're talking about 25 million plus jobs being created because of travel. So travel's big, one in 11 jobs in the world are related to travel. So in anything that um, helps facilitate travel, make travel better, um, I think will have a real impact on the society. Um, so I think that's some important context. Um, you know, as, as it relates to the opportunity, I think the, the digital revolution gives the travel industry and the hotel industry, in, in my case, tremendous opportunity to enhance the guest experience. And um, my company is spending a lot of time, money, and resources on thinking about how we can do that. And not just when someone is at our hotel, you know, in the four walls of the hotel, but well before they come to the hotel and then after they leave the hotel. So really trying to enhance the entire travel journey. And what can digital do to help that? What can data and technology do to enhance that? So we are doing um, a lot on our website and with our mobile app to help people with the pre-planning part of their trip with a lot of local area knowledge, et cetera. Um, you know, Marriott uh, purchased uh, Starwood Hotels and Resorts um, at the end of last year and now is the largest hotel company in the world. And interestingly, um, our website, our combined website, will be one of the largest retail websites in the world. Um, you know, I, travel is such a big part of what's sold on the internet. So we're spending a lot of time investing on making the pre-planning, the pre-trip um, experience really robust and, and deep and rich. And that's what that's what people want. You know, millennials, we talk so much about millennials, you know, all the research suggests that they want experiences more than things, and travel is an experience. Then when it comes to the hotel stay, how can we use um, digital capabilities to enhance the guest experience? I mean, there's so many uh, interesting things to do. Um, a couple examples to, to make it real. We've rolled out to all of our hotels um, globally mobile check-in and check-out. So you can check in with your phone. Um, and check out with your phone, and we're rolling out mobile keys, so you can go right to your room um, with your phone. And, um, you know, quite interesting. And I'll talk in a second about, so what are the implications to jobs then, because that's always, to, to your point, something people are thinking about. But just a couple other, you know, on-property examples. We're also rolling out at hundreds of hotels, soon to be thousands, beacon technology. So we can, um, people opt in for it, offer very tailored offers to people when they're at our hotels. They're often there for multiple days or a week if it's a vacation. So how can we make sure that we're giving people the offers that are meaningful to them while they're in, so it makes their experience deeper and richer and um, you know helps us of course you know um, uh, gain uh, more business from the clients when they're in our properties and then of course post stay there's so much we're doing to invest in that part of the dreaming about your next travel planning for your next uh, travel experience but on the job piece you know I think um, very analogous to um, and, and this is my personal opinion, what happened in banking, everyone thought ATMs, right, we're going to take away all the teller jobs. And what they really did was transform them, right? People don't, we were talking about this at a panel the other day, don't give out cash anymore, or, you know, or cash checks, right, because you can do that in the ATM, but they've become more relationship managers and selling other things. Likewise, when you think about a hotel, I think about the front desk. Um, will there be some impact? There, there very well could be, but we can also reskill the people at the front desk to not be about checking people in and out, but being more um, local area knowledge experts, upping their concierge skills, if you will, and again, enhancing the guest experience, um, making the guest experience better. So, um, you know, I think there's really in travel a tremendous um, amount of opportunity to use technology, to use data, to use what's happening in the digital space as a wonderful way to grow our industry, which in turn grows, grows jobs. And the, the last point I'd make on travel is that I do believe the more people travel, the more barriers are broken down between cultures and societies, and, and that's another added benefit of um, uh, our industry growing. Thank you. So we've looked at the business side. We've introduced what is the potential that can be unlocked. Minister, Rwanda has been a leader in innovation. What is um, the government side of this equation? Uh, what are the impacts that you've seen and you see in the future? Right. Uh, so if you permit, I will start with the last question, which is, the, which is the, on the impact. And I will pick just two examples that were discussed on, around this table. Uh, I'll start with uh, what Bruce said about the drones. Rwanda launched the, um, the first commercial drone program that goes out of sight. And it is in the business of delivering um, life-saving uh, medical products, in this case uh, uh, blood, to remote healthcare centers. Uh, the program has been operational for more than two months, and it's been very, very successful. 
In this case, I don't know how, Bruce, you quantify or um, monetize one life saved because a life doesn't have a cost. It costs everything. Everything we can invest to save that one life is worth every resource and every time we've put uh, in, the, in, in that um, business. So on, on, the, on the travel, I think one of the latest additions to the Marriott family is a beautiful hotel in Rwanda. I didn't know about uh, you know, 30 travels equal to one job because in my job, what keeps me awake every day is unemployment. And uh, Marriott has uh, contributed to creating 250 jobs in Rwanda, which are going to increase by creating this experience that makes everyone look forward to travel. So by increasing the, people, the number of people who travel, jobs are being created and impact is being generated uh, in Rwanda. So the, the, the next part of your question was about what is the government, uh, what is our perspective? I think the government should be in the role, in the job of enabling, you know, uh, uh, the growth of the digital economy, uh, removing every barrier, every friction, so that uh, those experiences can be increased and the, the kind of regulation that you talked about that are hampering the growth of digital economy can be removed. So five things. Quickly, one is connect and bring everyone online. There is a huge potential that is still trapped in the four billion people that are not connected globally. In Rwanda, we are talking about five million and want to bridge that gap you know, in the next, just in the next three years. The second is educate and promote. Um, and I don't want to comment on this because I think it's self-explanatory. The third is regulate. So when I talk about regulate, it's not restrict. It's actually put in place a modern regulatory environment that gives confidence and trust to all participants in the ecosystem. In certain cases, it is deregulate. One thing that we don't want to deregulate is the, our airspace with drones. We want to make sure that air travel is safe, but at the same time, we don't want to put a break to innovation. And it's possible. We have done it, and uh, I get so many calls and visits of people who come and see, how did you do it in Rwanda? Um, and, and we are open to share the lessons we've, we've learned in the process. The fourth is invest, and finally, it's cooperate. There is no one, no single country, no single industry that can figure out how to make the digital economy grow, so it's something that has to be uh, uh, done in partnership with everyone. So before we close this press conference, I would like to provide the opportunity for questions. Uh, we have a couple of microphones in the room, so if you would like to raise your hands. If we don't have any questions, um, I would like to first thank um, all of our panelists for sharing their insights. Uh, thank everyone in the room who's attended uh, and watched online in the live stream audience. And I will also like to encourage you all to visit the Digital Transformation of Industries Initiative webpage. Um, as Bruce said, they launched on Tuesday their findings. You will find all of their reports, all the documents that Accenture um, also contributed to. Um, and it's a wonderful place to, to read. So that could be your weekend reading. So again, thank you to our panelists and to everyone in the room.